Gentlemen, I'd like to formally recognize some of our dignitaries before we go into the program proper. At the head of the entourage today is the chairman of the Governing Council and the Pro-Chancellor of our University, Emeritus Professor T.O.K. Audo. Somebody asked me a while ago, how old is our Pro-Chancellor? And I said, just watch when he stands up to talk. He'll be very sprightly, and um, as we announced him just now, you could tell that uh, he stood up like a 50 year old young man. Chairman, sir, we welcome you to this event. We want to welcome in a very special way the representative of the visitor to our university, a very distinguished young man. We used to call him fine boy, he's still a fine boy, a distinguished professor of sociology, the acting deputy vice chancellor admin, Ambrosale University, Professor Theophilus Agueda. Please make him welcome to this event. I know that he was called fine boy because he was my classmate. So, I'm just revealing a few of the things that some of you didn't know about him. I'd like to also welcome the keynote speaker for today, a very distinguished Nigerian, a man who sits astride a university like this, a man who I know apart from speaking here today, has come to copy some of the good things that we are doing. Please join me in welcoming to this event the Vice Chancellor of the Federal University of Lokoja, Professor Olayemi D. Akimumi, who is in our midst. Can we welcome him? Thank you very much, sir. I'd like to welcome also the various members of council here present. I had seen uh, Professor Keme earlier. We want to thank you for your service to this university and to mankind. We'd like to welcome the representative of the Chief Judge of Edo State, the Honorable Chief Judge D.I. Okungbawa, who is here very ably and warmly represented by Honorable Justice Williams Idemudia Isaac Bemi. Please make him welcome to this event. I want to welcome to our event a former Vice Chancellor and a distinguished medical lab scientist, a man 
who scored several firsts at Ekboma and in Nigeria. Please make welcome Professor Dennis um, Agbonaho. I beg your pardon. Professor Dennis Agbonaho. Actually, I chuckled a bit because I wasn't sure that that was Professor Agbonaho. He's looking 20 years younger than his age. Prof, welcome. You must be living very well. We thank God for his grace. We'd like to also make welcome the people who give support to our university. I can see the manager of uh, UBA Aoti branch, Alaji Dr. Kasim Ashemogi. Welcome to this event. Very distinguished, ladies and gentlemen, I already announced that in the Vice Chancellor's entourage, uh, deans, directors, provosts, principal officers of the university. The registrar is here seated. Alaji Idris Khalifu would like to welcome you. We want to welcome the exchequer, uh, Dr. Osifo. We want to recognize and welcome the two Deputy Vice Chancellors, Deputy Vice Chancellor Admin and the Deputy Vice Chancellor Academics. Welcome to this event. At this point, it is time to begin the business for which we are here. Today is the Founders Day lecture commemorating the eighth anniversary of our establishment as a university. And we are very privileged to have the young man who has piloted the affairs of this university since in its inception as the captain who is still here. And nobody can tell the story better than him. It is my honor, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, to invite to the microphone this morning Mr. Vice Chancellor, Engineer Professor Emmanuel Aluyo, to give his opening remarks. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir. His Excellency, Mr. Godwin Norgegase Obaseki, the Executive Governor of Edo State and visitor to Edo State University, Zare, ably represented by the Acting Deputy Vice Chancellor, Ambrose Ali University. Professor Agueda. The chairman of today's ceremony, who is also the pro-chancellor and chairman of the Edo State University Council, Professor Emeritus T.O.K. Audu. The Chief Judge of Edo State, Honorable Justice Daniel Yobosa Okumboa, who is ably represented by Aziek Beni. The guest speaker, the keynote address speaker of today's ceremony, who is the Vice Chancellor of the Federal University, Lokoja ably represented by Professor Mike Ugirima, Provost of the College of Health Sciences, Federal University, Lokoja. The guest speaker of today's ceremony, Mrs. Celerina Ujomo, former acting registrar, University of Benin, who is ably represented by Dr. Osa, who is the director of the Institute of Education, University of Benin. The members of council of Edo State University, Uzari, the principal officers, the provosts, deans, directors, and members of Senate 
of Edo State University, Zaroui. Your Royal Highnesses, His Royal Highness Moses Akperenka, the Ogepa of Wepa, and indeed all the chiefs of the Zaroui Council of Chiefs. Let me specially welcome uh, Mrs. Oshomole, the mother, Mama Oshomole, the mother of our founding visitor, Senator Comrade Adams Oshomole. The heads of the para, the security agencies in, a, uh, in this uh, locality, uh, I can see the Federal Road Safety and the police. Distinguished guests, my dear staff and students of Edo State University, Zari, ladies and gentlemen. It is with profound honor and utmost privilege that I extend a hearty welcome to esteemed luminaries and participants at this auspicious occasion of the 8th Founders Day Ceremony of Ode State University, Uzari. In the relatively brief span of eight years since its inception, our esteemed institution has established an indelible legacy earning acclaim, both nationally and internationally. I'm filled with profound gratitude and eager anticipation for the journey that lies ahead. I extend a sincere welcome to our distinguished special guest of honor, His Excellency, Mr. Godwin Nogegase of Baseki, the Executive Governor of Edo State, who is ably represented by Professor Agueda for his unwavering support and attentive ears that have been invaluable to us. I would like to also extend a warm welcome to the Honorable Commissioner for Education, who has promised to join this ceremony online. Uh, I also acknowledge uh, the Head of Service, who has sent a representative and who is also joining online. Our esteemed guest of honor, and Chancellor of the Edo State University, Zare, Dr. Adiremi Makanjola, whose steadfast support has been a cornerstone of this institution's progress. I extend my, heart, my hearty gratitude. It is with great enthusiasm that I welcome the chairman of today's occasion, who is my personal mentor, Professor Emeritus T.O.K. Audu, whose exemplary humility serves as an inspiration to us all. Your presence here, your presence here is deeply valued. Permit me to recognize the keynote speaker of this ceremony, Professor Laemi. Duro Timi Akimumi, who the Vice Chancellor of Federal University, Lokoja, who suddenly became indisposed yesterday after planning this journey, and has had to send Professor Mike, has had to send Professor Mike Ogirima to represent him. We are elated to have you in our midst and look forward to your address. I also wish to welcome the guest speaker, Lady Sererina Mercy Ojomo, former Registrar University of Benin, Executive Director, Independent Television and Radio, and member of the Governing Council, Benedia University of Kada, who again was unable to come in person, but has been represented in this uh, gathering. 
To all our visiting vice chancellors and rectors of sister tertiary institutions, I express sincere appreciation for your presence. To our esteemed royal fathers, Yogineni uh, of Uzare, who, despite his inability to come for this ceremony, uh, has exemplified his support for this institution as uh, the host community with the array of chiefs that we have in this ceremony today. His Royal Highness Moses Akpamuka, the Ogiepa of Wepa, your support is indeed one that we cherish very well and will continue to cherish. I express our profound gratitude for your unwavering support and partnership with the university. Distinguished guests, I take this opportunity to highlight some notable achievements of the university. From its models beginning with two faculties and eight programs, Edo State University of Zari has expanded to encompass nine faculties, offering over 30 undergraduate programs. The university has earned acclaim from various regulatory bodies, including the National Investors Commission and the Times Higher Education Impact Ranking. Recently, precisely in 2022, Edo State University earned acclaim, was honored as the 10th best university in Nigeria, as the second as the second best state university in Nigeria, and as the, and as the best university in the South-South geopolitical zone. <laughs> to date, that is the only ranking that has been done by the National Investors Commission, by no less a person than National Investors Commission, who is saddled with regulating tertiary uh, university education in Nigeria. This, task, this achievement stands as a testament to our collective dedication and pursuit of excellence. It is with great enthusiasm that I share the remarkable news that our first set of graduates from our esteemed Faculty of Law accomplished a welcome feat in the final bar examinations. Their exceptional dedication and unwavering commitment have resulted in a remarkable 100% pass rate in their examination. This achievement not only underscores the caliber of education and guidance provided by our esteemed institution, but also serves as a testament to the relentless efforts and perseverance of our aspiring legal professionals drawn from the culmination of years of rigorous academic training and preparation. We also recall that last year, both the Council of the Medical Laboratory Science Council and that of uh, midwifery and nursing commended the university by being the university that presented students who passed 100% in their professional exams. The College of Postgraduate Studies in our university has distinguished itself through its highly successful programs, offering postgraduate masters and PhD degrees across various faculties. For our undergraduate programs, we have graduated five sets thus far, and our accreditation process consistently has yielded impressive results, with the lowest recorded score standing at 82.1%. In pursuit of our vision and mission, Edo State University of Zari has established collaborative partnerships with renowned international institutions, such as the Worcester State University, USA, and the University of Sunderland that affords our students invaluable 
opportunities for international exchange programs. The university holds full membership in the Association of African Universities, AAU, and is also a member of the International Uni Association of Universities, IAU. Edo State University of Zari boasts of well-equipped science laboratories, fully furnished mass communication studio, and temperature-controlled lecture halls, fitted with smart boards and projectors. Additionally, we have a suit hostess available for students' accommodation, amongst other amenities. Furthermore, the university operates its own teaching hospital, the Edo State University Teaching Hospital, Auchi, established through the conversion of the Central Hospital Auchi by the Edo State Government. This significant upgrade with enhanced facilities has supported the training of our medical students. Conclusively, I extend a warm and sincere welcome to all of you who have graced this eight Founders Day ceremony of our university. I'm profoundly grateful for the unwavering spirit of unity and support demonstrated by all our esteemed guests who have graced us with their presence today. May divine blessings be upon you, each of you, and every one of you. The management of Edo State University of Zaire humbly implores you to stand alongside us as we embark on our mission to cultivate a world-class institution and a beacon of educational eminence. Your partnership is invaluable to our pursuit of excellence. Once again, thank you for your gracious presence. Can we give him another round of applause? I have just been told that the quality of clapping today is affected by the fact that both Christians and Muslims are fasting. But you know we do more when we fast. And so may the Lord energize us to give more claps. Can we clap for the Vice Chancellor for that brilliant welcome address? We'd like to ask the Chairman of Council Emeritus Professor T.O.K. Audu, the Post Chancellor of our university, to please give us the, his opening remarks. Your Excellency, the Executive Governor of Edo State, Mr. Godwin Oegase Obaseki, ably represented the Commissioner for Education who is joining us by Zoom members of council senate our traditional rulers who have always giving us their support whenever we extend invitation to them. Our distinguished guests, students, ladies, and gentlemen, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome you all to our Eight Founders Day Ceremony. On behalf of the Governing Council, I joyfully welcome the Executive Governor of Edo State and visitor to the University, Mr. Godwin Obaseki. I thank you for your presence. Whether in person or represented, you are with us. We recognize you. Founders Day is a moment to remind ourselves the institutional culture and principles 
that emphasize our mission. It is a time to celebrate those who had the vision to sow a seed of knowledge that benefits others and to say we are grateful to them for contributing to the society. This celebration is also an opportunity to remind us to always sow a good seed because every seed sown has the potentials to affect people either positively or negatively. I am sure in our own case that seed is affecting people positively. Edo State University is a definition of a good seed that stimulates growth in the university, in the Nigerian university system. At inception, eight years ago, there were doubts as to how well we could go. But the principles and values with which the university was established made it turn out to be beneficial to everyone at home and abroad. It will interest you to know that in the last eight years, the institution has made a lot of giant strides, which include introduction of new courses, completion of students' entrepreneur E3 building to complement their recreational center, construction of additional male and female hostels for suitable accommodation for students, expansion of postgraduate school, construction of table water company for the university, transformation and elevation of the central hospital in Aochi to a full-fledged teaching hospital. Your Excellency, distinguished guests, in all sincerity, the growth of Edo State University of Zaire is not a surprising one. It took a lot by a hard work of a committed team to get this far. And the progression goes across all segments of university administration down to the graduation of quality students who are capable of representing the institution and the society at large. In less than a decade, Edo State University of Zaire has flourished beyond the imagination of everyone, even beyond the vision of the founders. For these great achievements in a short time, I commend the clear vision and mission of the founding father of this university, former executive governor of Edo State and senator of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Senator Adams Oshomole, for his vision for his vision and mission and his passion for quality education. May God continue to bless him with more wisdom and keep him in good health to enjoy the fruit of his labor. To His Excellency, the Executive Governor of Edo State, Governor Godwin Nogegase of Baseki, I thank you for believing in the vision, for your support to the university as one of the founding fathers, having served as secretary of the implementation committee that started the university. <clears throat> to others who have in one way or the other contributed to the development of this institution, both home and abroad, I say, 
Thank you. In conclusion, I will continue to pledge my time and support for the growth and development of this university. And I pray God will continue to support our vision and mission to permanently place Edo State University, Uzairwe, on the educational map of the world. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you very much, uh, Pro-Chancellor. Can we please applaud him again as he goes back to his seat? Thank you very much. We are making rapid progress. At this point, we are going to commence one of the cardinal things that we're doing today, which is a lecture. And it is the very first lecture, which will be given by the keynote speaker. And that keynote speaker is Professor Olayemi D. Akinwumi. Just before he stands up to speak, may I invite him to please be upstanding while we do a brief citation on him. Professor Olayemi, please. Thank you very much. Pro-Chancellor, sir, very distinguished ladies and gentlemen. The Vice Chancellor of the University of Lokoja, Professor Olayemi Akinwumi, who is our keynote speaker today, is here very, very ably represented by Professor Mike Ogirima, MNI. Professor Ogirima is the Provost of the College of Health Sciences, Federal University, Lokoja. He's standing in the shoes of Professor Olayemi Akinwumi, PhD, FNAL, -N -N FHSN, FSP, SP. Professor Olayemi is a distinguished professor of history. He started his higher education at the University of Illinois, where he obtained his bachelor's degree in 1985, and followed very quickly with his master's and PhD degrees in history from the same university. He is a fellow of the Historical Society of Nigeria, FHSN, a fellow of the Nigerian Academy of Letters, NAL, a fellow Society for Peace Studies and Practice, FSPSP, and former president of the Historical Society, First Academic Society in Nigeria. <laughs> Professor Akinwumi began his academic career at the University of Illinois and rose to become a senior lecturer in 1996. He then proceeded to Germany to pursue further studies and research. On his return to Nigeria, he joined the services of Nasara State University, Kefi, where he served in several capacities, such as head of department, deputy dean, dean two-term chairman of the committee of deans and directors, senate representative in the governing council, where he served on many committees, director institute of governance and development studies, Director of Research and Publications, and Dean School of Postgraduate Studies, and Deputy Vice Chancellor Academics. <laughs> Professor Kumi is an erudite scholar with over 70 publications in national and international journals. Two of his major works, books, were published in Germany 
and has attended conferences in over 30 countries of the world. Professor Kiumi was appointed the third vice chancellor of the Federal University, Lokoja, by the Governing Council on Friday, 18th December, 2020, following the very rigorous interview conducted by the council, where he emerged as the best and the most suitable candidate of 81 professors that had applied for the position. It is on record that since assumption of duty as vice chancellor on Monday, the 15th of February, 2021, Professor Kiwumi has brought many remarkable developments and transformed the university in several facets. His administration has dramatically uplifted the standard of Federal University Lokoja to an enviable height, bringing the 11-year-old university to a global visibility. Despite all these feats recorded in a short time, Akiumi has remained focused and committed to his vision and plan. Within the first year of office of the Akiumi administration, the Federal University Lokoja ranked first among the 12 federal universities established within 2011 and 2012. From the position of eight, that is, it took about eight position before its assumption of office among, according to the NUC ranking of universities in 2021. This notable achievement is in addition to the fact that the webometric ranking of World Universities Report earlier released where Lokoja was ranked 35th in Nigeria and third among the, the 12 new universities has been sustained and indeed surpassed. His passionate desire and vision has been to make Federal University of Lokoja an ICT-driven university for teaching, learning, research, aggressive internal revenue generation, massive infrastructural development, introduction of additional academic programs, improved funding, institutionalization of university culture, promoting quality applied research, ensuring staff and students' welfare, and establishment of linkages with local and global bodies, as well as well many Nigerians. Professor Kiwumi has achieved all this through his open door policy and all inclusive style of leadership in making the Federal University Lokoja a world class 21st century citadel of learning. Ladies and gentlemen, I present you therefore this morning this very erudite scholar, this man who has traversed many paths, this man who knows how to exfoliate the onion, this man who is a father, a lover of people and of his family. Please welcome to the microphone his representative, Professor Mike Ogirima, to present his address. Thank you, the orator, the chairman of this occasion, the executive governor of Edo State, ably represented, the Edo State Commissioner of Education Online, the Chancellor of the University, the Pro-Chancellor and Chairman of Edo State University Council and Chairman of this occasion, Emeritus Professor Tioke Aldo. The Vice-Chancellor, Professor Emmanuel Aluyo. Our guest lecturer, ably represented, Lady Selena Ojomo. Management staff and students of this great university. Our traditional 
Highnesses, gentlemen of the press, ladies and gentlemen. Of course, this is a speech that was supposed to be presented by himself, my vice chancellor. I was on a business trip and he called me this morning to download his speech because he became suddenly indisposed. He's a workaholic man. The man is always on the field. You enter the campus, the campus is in various stages of construction from starting a foundation and to finishing some projects. Of course, permit me to tell you that my College of Health Science is one of the six programs he started within the last three years of his administration. So I will present his speech. He will take the credit, but wherever I make the mistake, I will take the blow. Please permit me to start with a quote from the former President of the United States, Barack Obama, 2016. Here I quote, research has shown that diverse groups are more effective at problem solving than homogeneous groups and policies that promote diversity and inclusion will enhance our ability to draw from the broadest possible pool of talent, solve our toughest challenges, maximize employee engagement and innovation, and lead to example by setting a high standard for providing opportunity to all segments of our society." Unquote. The above quotation underscores the import of diversity and inclusion in the university system at the level of university administration, staffing, and studentship. In other words, the utility of diversity and inclusion does not only need to be manifest in university administration. As a matter of fact, university administration needs to be guided by the concepts of diversity and inclusion in the management of the system, as it captures one of the major criteria of ranking universities. As regards the concept administration, it is basically the management and organization of resources for the purpose of achieving identified objectives. For Edo State University, Uzaire, just like other universities, I believe the core objectives are anchored on teaching, research, and community development. These objectives, I also believe, could best be achieved in a conducive academic environment where diversity and inclusion are the watchwords. As a matter of fact, just as the dictum, university connotes universal, meaning an embracing and encompassing institution of learning with emphasis on diversity, not just as field of study, but also in terms of personnel. Thus, university as a citadel of learning is anchored on diversity and inclusion. That is, diversity as regards fields of study, studentship, support, and academic personnel. From the above, it therefore means that if the institution called a university is managing the university needs to be diverse, in the Nigeria university system, I must state that in recent years, appointment into management or administrative positions are becoming excessively localized with emphasis on indigenous personnel occupying sensitive administrative positions. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, please permit me to say that the appointment into management position in most state universities are becoming quotalized or sectionalized with emphasis on balancing among the senatorial zones. 
This scenario, I must confess, is also becoming manifest in federal universities. The system, no doubt, constitutes limitation to achieving academic excellence in the Nigerian university system, which I believe the guest lecturer will unfold more implications. The structure of the Nigerian university system. The structure of the Nigerian university system, especially public universities, are, as regards administration, are designed to be diverse and inclusive. The diversiveness and inclusivity in, in university administration is quite visible in the structures and layers of university administration, which are anchored on well-defined community system. These are the governing council and council of committees, the office of the vice chancellor and management committee, the university senate and senate committees, faculty boards, faculty committees and directorates, departmental boards and committees, the alumni body, student affairs unit, student union government or representative and rights associated with membership of such bodies, and lastly, university community interactions. However, it is expected that this administrative structure will effectively function well if personnel in recruitment and students' enrollment into the system conforms with diversity and inclusiveness. Thus, the following strategies have been adopted over the years in ensuring inclusion and diversity, thereby achieving excellence in the university system. These are, one, providing windows for educational disadvantaged states in order to ensure national spread. Two, recent focus on international staffing and studentship as it constitutes one of the criteria for ranking universities. Three, catchment areas in order to ensure high sense of diversification and inclusion of host communities. Four, the use of merit and quota system in admission, especially in public university. And five, advertising vacant position in order to have a diverse range of applicants. From the above stated strategies, the question that comes to mind is, to what extent have these strategies worked well in ensuring diversity and inclusivity in the university system? As a matter of fact, one could convincingly state that factors such as quota and catchment has been ineffectively applied to the extent that they are undermining the system through excessive localization and therefore being on antithetical to the envisaged objectives. In addition, as regards inclusivity, the unstable nature of academic calendar of public-owned university as a result of industrial actions by registered unions, such as ASU, NASU, etc., has curtailed inclusion with the children of the rich moving to private universities or universities outside the country. And of course, we know the implication of Nigerian students' population moving to other countries for education on the social and economic development of the Nigeria state. Factors that affect inclusion and diversity in Nigeria system are, one, religion. Religion is supposed to be a functional instrument for upholding societal values, but unfortunately, in the Nigerian state, it constitutes a sharp divisive mechanism, which is also manifest in the Nigerian higher education system. In the Nigerian system, religion plays a major role in appointments into administrative position. As a matter of fact, in some faith-based institution, membership is restricted. This negates diversity and inclusivity. Two, poor remuneration. Poor remuneration is one of the factors that is affecting the ability of the university to attract the best manpower, both within and outside the country. For instance, during the President Umaru Yaradua's administration, an average professor 
in the university was earning between 2,000 to 2,000 to 2,500 US dollars. But with the present rate of devaluation of the Naira, coupled with galloping inflation, an average professor in the Nigerian public university earns less than 500 US dollars, which is one of the lowest in Africa. The question then is, how will the system attract quality manpower from other nationals into the system? in order to contribute to quality teaching, research, and administrative duties. As a matter of fact, some of the quality hands that the university could boast of have left the system for other countries. Three, ethnicity. Just like religion, ethnicity or ethnicism is a major factor that negates inclusivity and diversity in the Nigerian university system. Unfortunately, the administration of universities are becoming so ethnicized that the ethnic groups where the universities are located see it as a right to continuously produce or determine the appointment of the principal officers of the universities. The implication is that other layers of administrations are localized based on patronage and spoilt system. In some cases, we also have scenarios in which some staff are perceived to be marginalized in the university based on their ethnic origins. In my own opinion, whether real or fictitious, I think it is better for such perception to be based on inclusivity rather than exclusivity or marginalization. This, I believe, could best be achieved if appointments in the system I diversified rather than excessively skewed to a section of the state or the country. Four, political patronage. I must confess that we also have scenarios in which the appointment of principal officers in the system are based majorly on identification with a political party. As a matter of fact, we have seen a situation in which vice chancellors have been removed from office based on the fact that they were appointed by a previous governmental administration, especially if the new government is of a different political party. The implication is that the administrative style of the new vice chancellor might negate diverseness and inclusivity with emphasis on political directives for appointments of personnel. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, permit me to state that I have intentionally restricted myself to discussing the above stated four points, which constitutes limitation to inclusiveness and diversity in Nigerian university system, with the conviction and belief that our distinguished guest lecturer will further provide additional information on the limitation and thereby checking against repetitiveness in presentation. The way forward and conclusion. As an administrator and a keynote speaker, I think the stage is now set for us to further unfold the issue of diversity and inclusion in the Nigerian university administration. This, I believe, should also be inclusive in nature with guest lecturer opening our eyes to issues of interest as well as comments and questions from the university community. Ladies and gentlemen, for public universities, I think there are solutions that have to be provided by the government as regards administrative autonomy, as well as that which have to solve ourselves, which we have to solve ourselves as stakeholders in the university project, either as administrator, teaching or non-teaching staff, alumni and students. Thank you for listening. Can we please applaud him again, and again, and again? Thank you very much, Professor Ogirima. Um, he is standing, or he stood in for Professor Akewumi. Well, maybe, as they say, 
there are photocopies in professors. The man just merely looks at you and he deposits in you all that he was going to say. Because um, Professor Akumi perhaps would not have said it better. We want to thank you again for that beautiful paper. Thank you very much. Um, I know that some of us have questions, but we will save all the questions and comments until the second paper has been taken. And then we can take all the comments and questions at that time. To the next major matter, which is the guest lecture for today, to be delivered by Lady Celerina Mercy Ojomo, who is very ably represented at this event by Dr. Osa Iwosrei Ogato. Lady Celerina Mercy Ojomo was born on October the 28th. 1953, in Wari, present day Delta State, to Chief and Mrs. James Ekwere Otobo of Uzeri in Isoko South Local Government Area of Delta State. Chief James Ekwere Otobo was a prominent politician during the First Republic and was one of the forces behind the creation of Midwest region. Her educational journey began at the Children's Homes High School in Ibadan for her primary education, followed by St. Louis Grammar School, Ibadan, and then lastly, St. Louis College, Ondo, where she attained her West African School Certificate in 1969. Mrs. Ojomo pursued a Bachelor of Arts Honours degree in French from the then University of Ife, now known as Obafemi Awolowo University, Ile Ife, from 1970 to 1974. Later, she earned a Master's degree in Public Administration from the University of Benin. During her one-year language study abroad, in France, at the Institute de Touraine University de Porter, Tours, she was a government scholar. After completing her compulsory national service in Kui, in the then North Central State, Lady Salarina Ojamo commenced her working career at the University of Benin on August 20, 1975. Indeed, you can tell that Lady Ojomo is truly a Nigerian. She went to primary school in Ibadan, went to secondary school in Ibadan, went to Ondo to complete her secondary school, went to University of Ife, served at Kui in the then North Central. But in all of this, she was native, still native of Midwest, now Delta State, because it's from Wari. So she's truly Nigerian. Can we please applaud her? <clears throat> Salarina Ojomo commenced her working career at the University of Benin on the 20th of August, 1975. Universities and public service were still very good at that time because we strove for efficiency, for world class and for effective delivery. And to help Salarina achieve this, she was sent on an e-service training from January 1976 to May 1977 at the Margaret House College for Administrative and Secretarial Studies in London, England to hone her skills. Through dedication and hard work, Lady Salarina Ojomo steadily advanced in her administrative career at the University of Benin. She served in various capacities within the university registry and faculties. She became the very first female um, student affairs officer at the University of Benin in September 1990, and she was very legendary in that role. 
In October 2006, she was appointed acting registrar of the University of Benin, a position she occupied until her retirement in August, 20, in August 2010, after 35 years of exemplary and meritorious service. Post-retirement, Mrs. Ojomo wasn't tired, just as she's still not tired. She joined the Okada Group of Companies. She was the chairman of the Management Board of Independent Television and Radio. Presently, she serves as executive director of ITV and Radio. Additionally, she's a member of the governing council of the Benedictine University of Okada and has previously served on the governing council board of Benedictine Education Center, Benin City. Salarina Mercy Ojomo is married to Sir Dr. Edward Eronwa Ojomo, a knight of John Wesley of the Methodist Church, Nigeria, on May 21st, 1977. Their union has been blessed with three wonderful and adorable children, Dr. Michelle Eyoto Elupo, Dr. Osai Ojomo, and Mr. Osahon Ojomo, as well as four grandchildren, Estelle, Annabel, Joshua, and Mabel, still counting. Lady Celerina Ojomo is a member of the Nigerian Institute of Management and a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Public Administrators of Nigeria. She is a Jerusalem pilgrim, JP, and a life member of the Full Gospel Business Women and Men Fellowship. Actively involved in the humanitarian work, she worships at the Ojomo Memorial Methodist Church, Nigeria, in Benin City, where she serves as a senior steward. In recognition of her selfless contributions, Lady Ojomo was honored in August 2023 as the Neoma of the Women Fellowship of Methodist Church, Nigeria, Diocese of Edo Delta. She's also a Susanna Wesley Fellow of the Methodist Church of Nigeria. Ladies and gentlemen, Lady Salarina Ojomo loves traveling. She loves to read, and above all, she sings. I present to you this distinguished woman, this accomplished lady, this mother and dutiful wife, whose paper will be presented this morning by Dr. Osa Ewosroi. Ogato, Director of the Institute of Public Institute of Public Affairs and Head Services University of Benin. Dr. Hoswai, please come to the microphone. Thank you. Can we applaud him as he walks to the microphone? I would like to rest on the protocol that has been well established by the University Orator. Professor Marcel Okaku, as well as uh, other speakers before me. So it's with great pleasure that I'm here. But first and foremost, I bring warm greetings from the guest speaker, uh, Mrs. Lady, Mrs. Celerina Ujomo. Uh, up to yesterday afternoon, she was sure that she would be at this gathering in person. But some other exigencies uh, made it impossible as it were. And I had to set on the journey uh, from the University of Benin to come and represent her. But I'm very sure that her spirit is with us. And before reading her paper, I'd like to say that there are a few comments which uh, she mentioned. She has actually highlighted in her introductory statements the great, the great strides that have been achieved in eight years by this university. And uh, that appears to have been confirmed by me with the uh, photo speak that we just looked at during the interlude. And that has confirmed the fact that this university does not look as if it's only eight years old. Uh, it is much more established, much more rooted 
than those investors that have stayed for decades of years. So on that point, I'd like to quickly congratulate the management team of this university, starting from the council members, the management team led by the vice chancellor, our own very Professor Aluyo, because he has one leg at the University of Benin. So, and again, the staff, the staff and students, the deans. In fact, most of what we are say, going to say, or what has been said by Professor Akin Wumi, speaks to the fact that Edo uh, State University, and it's also reflected here, in terms of looking at diversity and inclusion, Edo uh, State University Uzaru is number one. This assertion is evidence-based. If, uh, sorry, I left my program there. If you look at the configuration, no, I was just going to, if you look at the configuration, in terms of the management team, you find that they come from diverse backgrounds. The same with the students' population. So I'd like to congratulate you, and Edo State University, uh, Uzarwe, uh, should be one in which others will come align how to practice and manage diversity for the overall productivity and performance of an organization. Thank you very much. Again, I'd like to also mention that the cross of the discourse has already been laid by Professor Akin Wumi, and uh, you'll find that we are going to have uh, some points of convergence in what he presented and what we prepared to, uh, you will know that these points of convergence will speak to the fact that these are ideas that are required to be implemented uh, with a view to achieving better university, in fact, organizational uh, performance as a whole, and the university is an organization. So we are going to have, point. we didn't sit down to do this together, but you find that it means it is universal evidence. That is an idea, that the idea has come in the first place. Uh, it may have been inadvertently, unconsciously put in place by university administrators. And of course, but what we are going to emphasize here is that first and foremost, it's an idea that we assist in putting universities at the forefront in this post 21st century. So having said that, I'd like to read a paper. It is with pleasure that I stand before this August gathering of eminent members of the academia, distinguished government functionaries and administrators, as well as the citizens who are part and parcel of the organization, both internal and external, to share my thoughts on issues of fostering an efficient university administration. As you well know, this is an arena that I have navigated for a better part of my working life. The, the, during the citation, at least you had a bit of the fact that uh, the guest lecturer has been part and parcel of university administration for over 35 years, operating at different levels of operation. I make bold, however, to make the assertion that the university is a complex organization with a diverse workforce and stakeholders in many respects. By its very nature, the university system is beclouded by numerous challenges with new and unforeseeable challenges in the works. These challenges reflect several bearings. What we're talking about here is that there are so many challenges which pervade the university administration system. Most of it are unforeseen. But very briefly, we'll look at some of these. This, in modern times, relates to issues such as technological changes, political, cultural, and economic, to mention but a few. All these factors are external, put external pressure on the operations of the university system. 
And unless we go with it, uh, it perhaps would obviate whatever achievements that uh, we have ever had, as it were. These challenges have added stress and strains on the overall functioning of the system, and hence we consider it a complex system. At this juncture, perhaps it is important to properly situate this gap of the university as a complex organization. Hence, we will at this point explore the essential features of complexity, which confront the university of today. A starting point for identifying complexity is the presence of multiple diverse interdependent agents. Interdependence among multiple diverse agents produce novel outcomes, particularly when the agents and forces affecting the system are changing constantly. Uh, you find that whatever factors we are looking at, as the saying goes, the only permanent thing is change. It's always constantly changing. You can't hold it back. And the university, as an organization that ought to innovate, that ought to teach new facts, evidence-based facts, must also change with the environment it finds itself. It is to be noted that multiple diverse interdependent agents are present in educational institutions or organizations, most pointedly by the form of hundreds of specialized professionals through academia, and the administrators who collectively attempt to organize into effective delivery systems and units. The agents often converge, often diverge in their reporting and incentive structures. The specialized support and technical service workers add to the diversity of the university delivery setting. Putting a system of multiple diverse and interdependent agents into motion, interacting to deliver services creates a vast level of complexity. More so when the agents themselves adapt and change over time due to self-learning and development or new requirements from regulatory, advisory, or legal sources or other causes. And hence, Complexity is accelerated geometrically. It is to be noted that the challenge of managing organizations of all types has been aptly summarized by the concept of professional bureaucracy, which has been enunciated by uh, Minsberg, 1983. Minsberg identified five parts of his uh, bureaucratic structure. It has a strategic apex, it has a middle, a middle management, it has support staff, technical staff, and an operating core. Managing an operating core comprised of professionals and managing highly specialized support staff are quite different from managing other staff. The point being made here is that you find several specialized staff operating within the university system, which is our major focus in this delivery. We have support staff, we have middle staff, and all these have their own demands on the system. They have their own ideas and all that. So all these constitute the internal environment, which I alluded to earlier, that we impart, we try to extract from the focus of the university, or support, as the case may be. In addition to internal organizational complexity, a major sort of complexity in university management is the scope and diversity of what is typically called the external environment. A host of different agents are operating in the university external environment, including government organizations, suppliers of technologies, professional and trade associations, research organizations, educational organizations and others. As I said earlier, the, uh, Professor Akun will mention some of the practical aspects of what we are saying. Where the external environment, through government fiat, can dissolve government councils, they can remove uh, 
the vice chancellor, and all that. And I think at the present, uh, most federal universities are operating without uh, governing council. So that's the kind of external environmental factor, the, which is made up of the political. If, for example, you don't have Lini, as it was ably mentioned by Professor Akinwumi, uh, or due to misinformation of certain actions by the vice chancellor and the governing council. You know, political, the way the political arena operates is different from uh, the way others operate. If the information is given that by setting, even though the university system we were supposed to, uh, there was this saying in those days that you are free uh, to teach and to make certain statements, but we know it's no longer so. Uh, if the vice chancellor here is perceived to have leaning for some others, for the enemies, in quotes, let's put it that way, it will be a different thing. I think that's the point being emphasized here, that there are so many external factors out of which the uh, politics is a major issue. Further still, universities are a vital piece of the social and cultural fabric of societies. And these two are subject to social and cultural pressures from a variety of sources. Uh, I mean, this point is uh, quite clear, you know. By way of summarizing the complexity in university management, we can identify certain features, which include one, multiple, diverse, and interdependent agents, a dynamic system in the sense that the agents change over time. I think I've made allusions to that. Uh, if governing councils made up of very competent people are dissolved by governmental fiat, then uh, that could pull a string on the, uh, on the performing aspect of that particular highest level of administration in the university system. So that's why we say dynamic, it's a dynamic system agents can change over time. And of course, when new people come on board, uh, aside from the statutory limitations, it's bound to start afresh again. And, uh, I think it happened in our university some time ago, that's the University of Benin, where, for example, because of political exigencies, uh, the chairman of council, though eventually was not inaugurated because ASU immediately took that up. That's why we say, once you have a diverse and vibrant system, it will help in pushing the system forward. I think somebody who was not very close to university administration or management was politically appointed as a, member, as a chairman of the governing council. And of course, we knew right from the beginning that it was going to be a disaster because you won't understand exactly what we are talking about because the university system is peculiar and complex. I think I still raised alarm. And I think the government, I'm talking of several years back, I think the government uh, decided after announcing the composition of that council to reappoint another council. Because somebody who never had the benefit of even university education. So he won't understand. And that's part of the problem we talk about. ASU may be seen as a trade organization as being recalcitrant, but they also keep the system going. They put in things that allow for proper management, okay? The third factor that we have identified as one of the characteristics of a complex organization to which the university system fits is that we have complex internal organizational structure. Uh, it has been alluded to. Uh, we have the committee system, we have several structures, but it's so complex because you find that at a point in time, uh, some people believe it delays. It delays implementation of certain things and all that. But I think uh, it's not exactly like that. Because the whole essence is to bring about participatory uh, kind of involvement of all people within, within the, the system, as it were. So that at the end, that's why the committee system, as mentioned, is a fundamental uh, feature of the university administrative structure. Four, we have scope and diversity of external environment. That is, I've talked about it earlier. Then we also have, lastly, the low consensus on the nature of problems or understanding 
of the cause and effect in solving problems. From the foregoing, it is glaring that the work of university management today is really simple. That's why, uh, once again, we congratulate the entire management of this university for what they have achieved in the last eight years. Yes, <clears throat> I have said that it is glaring that the work of university management today is really simple, really, I mean, straightforward and predictable. There are so many factors that can immediately turn the tide around, and so it requires constant evaluation of what is being done and all that. The question that arises, therefore, is how do managers in the university system work effectively in these circumstances of complexity, which we have tried to establish? Effectively managing in these complex circumstances requires a number of skills and strategies, as well as tools which are enhanced by transformational and resilient leadership. Again, the point being emphasized here is that good leadership is in a better position. And the adjective there, transformational leadership and resilient leadership, that it is primarily the instrument regarded for announcing uh, certain issues. And uh, some people have also attempted to distinguish between leadership and management. Well, some conceptual clarifications will suffice here regarding the two concepts, leadership and management. Both concepts have much in common because both refers to ways to get things done in organizations. But for some purposes, such as describing work in simple or complicated settings versus work in complex settings, it is useful to separate the two terms. To get things done, leadership works through mobilizing others by utilizing tools not necessarily possessed by managers. Managers largely rely on authority in order to mobilize others. On the other hand, leadership or leaders inspire others through discovering common purpose and passion. Other distinctions between management and leadership include the notion that managers focus on efficiency, that is doing the most with the least, while leaders focus on effectiveness, that is goal attainment. The distinction between leadership and management relates to the shorter term and operational focus of management compared to the longer terms and strategic focus of leadership. Management works better when there is agreement on goals and how to achieve them, which is more likely to be the case in the shorter term than the longer term. Leadership is needed when consensus on the what and knowledge about the how are relatively low, which again is more likely to be the case in the longer run. In the longer run. Add to that the fact that Change is ubiquitous in most organizational delivery systems, and that what worked in the past may not work in the future. I had mentioned that before, that change is a constant. So you cannot rely on the fact that, oh, this was how we used to do it, and it worked. It may have worked at that time, given the contingencies, given issues at stake, which will be quite different, especially in this technological world that we find ourselves. Thus, this limits the effectiveness of a focus on efficiency. Hence, managing complex organizations need the competencies of leaders. Generally, the terms manage and lead are applied to those individuals charged with managing or leading in complex organizations. And these terms are often applied interchangeably. So when we talk about leadership and managers or management, where the point being conversed here is that leadership goes beyond management and that what we need in the university system is leadership. But as we have said, uh, these terms uh, are generally speaking um, 
applied interchangeably. At this juncture, it is pertinent to examine certain postulations by way of guidelines for managing and leading in university system, given present realities and perceptions of universities as complex organizations. In this regard, a number of such guidelines abound in the literature. However, this presentation elaborates five guidelines, which in the opinion of the writer, represent the wide breadth of knowledge about managing complex organizations, deriving from both theory and practices. And these are one, encourage exploration. Two, manage and reap the benefits of diversity. This is the cross of the matter. This is the final point, the high point of this presentation, which we talk about. But you already see points of convergence between the last speaker and this presenter. Because one fundamental issue, one guideline for proper management, the second one emphasizes the whole idea of managing and reaping the benefits of diversity. And of course, inclusion is the flip side of diversity. Three, build connections. Four, conduct shared sense making. And finally, use simple rules. So we just say one or two sentences about each of these guidelines to find out how workable they are. First, encourage exploration. This involves searching for new possibilities through experimentation, discovery, and innovation. It requires refining and extending existing products and services. Managing in a complex environment means almost by definition that the organization is trying to find its way. There is insufficient clarity about what to do and how to get it done. Learning about the world requires taking action and learning from this action. Emphasis on innovation, thinking of new ways of doing things. And when we talk about exploration, it means all segments of the university setting should be involved. And that is what ought to be with the committee system and all that. But we do know some of those primordial factors that impinge on the appointment of committees and other bodies that ought to contribute. We ought to hear the voices of people who, who may not go along with the general majority, because that may perhaps be the way out, you know? But you know, this requires a level of comfort with decision making under uncertainty. In such an environment, managers and leaders need to realize that they are, in essence, exploring the solution space. Next steps that move the organization, or what we refer to as fitness landscape, that is looking for adaptive ways in the direction of higher performance. To get a better sense of what will work, organizations in the, director, in, in the direction of higher performance, leaders and teams need to try out different approaches and methods and see what works. Systematic fail fast and learn approaches to innovation, including user-centered design, rapid cycle prototyping, and good enough evaluation methods enable modern organizations to maximize their chances of success when operating under conditions of complexity. Thus, one key principle of managing a complex environment is to explore the point is made succinctly that doing the same thing over and again is likely to get you the same results. So the admonition is that you try something new and see what happens. The second guideline, manage and reap the benefits of diversity. Complexity science teaches us that when properly used, diversity of thoughts and point of view helps teams and organizations explore their solution space with greater success and exigency. Diversity does not just mean racial, ethnic, or gender diversity. 
It also applies to diversity in experience, in knowledge, in training, in roles and, per and, and perspective. Diversity of groups of people working on a problem have a broader range of knowledge about the organization, its environment, and the challenges it faces than more homogeneous groups. One set of people this, with the same ideas. That is not likely. Broader thinking engendered by diversity increases the probability that a good enough solution will be found by the group. However, to enhance the potential value of diversity, university leadership must enable two other capabilities. They must ensure that communi communication processes are such that all members of the organization are able to speak up and be heard by the other members of the group. Diversity of knowledge and point of view serves little purpose if it remains silent or unheard. In addition, there must be a process of curating the work of the group to ensure that quality standards are adhered to and that dialogue, evaluation, and decision-making processes are of high quality. To this extent, diverse groups with good communication, respect, and trust that use best practice for collecting and evaluating evidence will be most useful at exploring their fitness landscape and identifying new approaches that improve performance. As I said earlier, more will be said about managing diversity later in this presentation, since this is the cross of this paper. Another guideline thought is to build connections. Connections among individuals, groups, teams, functions, areas, departments, divisions, and agents outside the formal boundaries of the organizations are all necessary to provide the information flow necessary for organizational health. The traditional organizational hierarchy with its clear unidirectional reporting lines generates highly clustered central network structures that are characterized by slow information flow and, and decision making. This is characteristic of bureaucracies, which uh, the university system is almost uh, pushed into to operate like the normal public service. Uh, we do not generally, uh, generally speaking, perform well in response to complex changes. You see, these are some of the changes when you because the university is an agent of change, it is meant to, exper uh, uh, to experiment with new ideas, new approaches. But if you want to do it with the typical civil servant mentality, things will not work well. And that is the problem we have always had. In fact, regarding the last, uh, especially in federal universities, where the university system uh, was pushed into the IP's operational format, we find that it never worked. Because what we do here is that the vice chancellor, based on need, along with the council, they should have free hand in appointing and the discipline of staff. But when you want to operate the public service system, it will not work. And that's what we have seen here. So, the fourth. Eh? Okay, fourth, I will very, very quickly run into it so that I can go. We have, you conduct shared sense making. Shared sense making here refers to the process through which people work to understand issues or events that are novel, ambiguous, confusing, or in some other way, violate expectations. Shared sense making is related to mindfulness because the ability to pick up cues enhances sense making. It allows a nothing a more ordered environment from which further cues can be drawn. Taking action and seeing what happens next can improve sense making. Sense making also can be a positive force for creativity and innovation because it links employees to customers and the external world. The creation of novel understanding allows for new ways of doing things. Shared sense making allows participants to understand the nature of problems and opportunities and to propose innovative solutions as a collectivity, as a collective, 
rather than as isolated individual experts. Then finally, regarding the guidelines, is the admonition that we use simple rules. Typically, complex organization systems have three types of rules. Goal setting rules, boundary setting rules, and incentive rules. Goal setting rules define the objective of the organization, the posters with which the members of the organization align. Boundary setting rules define the allowed behavioral norms to be followed in working to achieve the goals. Incentives define the rewards to the agents for making progress towards the goals while following allowable behaviors. It is to be noted that in so much as the above guidelines for managing complex organizations have been preferred, two caveats needed to be observed. One is do not follow them slavishly. While the second is acquiring the ability to master them and all that. Like any strength or two, over reliance on these guidelines, and in particular the mistaken application of these methods to simple or complicated challenges may yield bad results for the individual leader as well as, well as the organization. Hence, judgment and the ability to apply these guidelines in behaviors requires a level of maturity and psychological development, which is rare in most new managers and leaders. Now, let's quickly, because of time constraint, to the question of how best to develop managers of leaders who understand complex systems and use simple rules, shared vision, and all others. First is to give them experience that enables them to learn. Again, we are talking about uh, exploration. That is, act your way to a new way of thinking. It's a developmental adage that expresses this advice. Second, those experiences with feedback and coaching experiences that focus on and build insight into the skills required to successfully manage in a complex environment. And I'd like to quickly mention that in this regard, mentoring is also very, very critical. You have to mentor new persons who will take on rules in terms of succession planning and all that. Now let's quickly go to this issue of managing diversity and inclusion uh, so that uh, we can quickly uh, share some thoughts before the time allocated for this presentation. The point has been succinctly made earlier that concern for and management of workplace diversity and inclusion should constitute a major plank in organizations operating in complex environments. Being the cross of this lecture, it is desirable at this juncture to explore the concept of diversity and inclusion in all its ramifications with a view to highlighting the imperatives for management of universities and indeed all organizations to key into conscious application of these principles. Diversity, no talking about the concept of diversity. Diversity and inclusion have become imperative goals for institutions of higher education, including the realm of university administration. The deliberate inculcation of diversity and inclusion into the Nigerian ed educational system has become imperative, given the current socioeconomic realities, the impact of technology and digital platforms, as alluded to earlier. Even the whole idea of diverse family orientation and value system, emerging cultures and societal standards, all have tended to push in this essence uh, of diversity, even in the work environment. By way of conceptual clarification, when we talk about diversity, what we, it is meant, the presence and appreciation of the presence of differences among individuals, including but not limited to race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, age, socioeconomic status, religion, disability, and cultural background. It encompasses visible and invisible characteristics that make such persons unique. Diversity is about recognizing that each person is unique 
and understanding their differences. The flip side of the coin, which is inclusion, on the other hand, involves creating an environment where all individuals feel welcome, respected, valued, and supported. It goes beyond mere tolerance to actively embracing and celebrating diversity. Inclusion ensures that everyone has equitable access to opportunities, resources, and decision-making processes, regardless of their background or identity. Inclusion focuses on efforts towards the system to feel safe, happy, and respected. In essence, therefore, diversity is about who is represented, while inclusion is about how individuals are treated and included in the community or organization. Both are essential for fostering creativity, innovation, and a sense of belonging in any setting, whether it is a workplace, other educational settings, or community. Diversity and inclusion are critical components of higher education. They create an inclusive environment that welcomes and supports students and staff from all backgrounds, fosters cross-cultural understanding, improves academic outcomes, prepares students for the workplace, and promotes social justice. Uh, I will just, we are all familiar with the term university administration, but because of time, we will skip that. But very quickly, I'd like to make one statement that university administrations refers to the management and governance of academic institutions, typically at the tertiary level, such as universities and other institutions of higher learning. It encompasses a broad range of activities and responsibilities aimed at ensuring the effective operation and advancement of this institution. University administration involves various administrative units, personnel, and processes that work together to support the institution's mission, goals, and objectives. And it is administration that helps plan, manage, organize, and execute various functions essential for university life. Uh, we will skip the others for want of time about what the university is all about. This presentation, we explore some key areas which we must all pay attention to as stakeholders of the education sector in order to promote diversity and inclusion in our institutions. It hopes to highlight the importance and significance of diversity and inclusion within university administration, the challenges faced in achieving true inclusivity, strategies to enhance diversity, etc. Then vis-a-vis -vis the role of this. Some of these, as I mentioned earlier, uh, have been alluded to by uh, uh, Professor Akiwumi. Okay, I'm, okay, thank you. Now, very briefly, why, why, why diversity and inclusion in university administration? One, it reflects students, uh, one of the key importance is that it reflects students' diversity. Universities serve diverse student populations, including individuals from various cultural, ethnic, socioeconomic, and demographic backgrounds. A diverse administrative team ensures that the leadership reflects and understands the needs of these diverse students, thus fostering a sense of belonging and support. This is obvious. People from different backgrounds, they come into this system with uh, uh, ways and means that they have been used to from their various cultural settings. So if we have a policy on diversity management and uh, its operations, its management, then you find that we can foster a sense of belonging and support. Two, enhancing decision making. Diversity in administration brings a range of perspectives, experiences, and ideas to the table. This diversity of thoughts leads to more innovative and effective decision-making processes as different viewpoints are considered 
resulting in better solutions to complex problems. Three, promoting equity and access. Inclusive administration ensures equitable access to resources, opportunities, and support services for all members of the university community. By addressing systemic barriers and biases, diverse leadership can work towards creating a more inclusive environment where everyone has the chance to thrive. Four, setting positive example. University administration sets the tone for the institution's values and culture. By prioritizing diversity and inclusion, administrators demonstrate a commitment to fairness, equality, and social justice, setting a positive example for students, staff, and the broader community. Five, preparing students for a diverse world. In their quest for knowledge, our students are better equipped to be confident, competent, and self-reliant with basic values of humanism, secularism, and democracy to make them capable of giving a fuller response to social, financial, and environmental challenges. In an increasingly interconnected and diverse world, most of us are, we now talk of the global village. And in fact, I think we have gone beyond the global village now. It's shrinking more and more with technology. So what we are saying here is that with this uh, increasingly interconnected and diverse world, students benefit from exposure to diverse perspectives and leadership styles. A diverse administrative team serves as role models for students, preparing them to navigate and succeed in diverse professional environments after graduation. Six, impact on employees. Diversity and inclusion can expose employees to various cultures, traditions, and perspectives, making them more competent. In the management of our unions, diversity and inclusion will increase employee satisfaction, foster positive attitudes and behaviors, as well as create better decision making through the combination of these groups of thinkers. Overall, diversity and inclusion in university administration are imperative for creating an environment where all members of the community feel valued, respected, and empowered to reach their full potential. The diversity of universities, employees, and students influences its strength, productivity, and intellectual personality. Diversity of attributes contributes to the richness of the environment for teaching and research. Inclusion is the ongoing and transformative process of improving education system to meet everyone's need, especially those we consider as being marginalized groups, marginalized groups and all that. Now we quickly say one or re-emphasize the challenges. Uh, the benefits of diversity notwithstanding, there is not an easy ride. There are obvious challenges especially in relation to the university system. Some of it were mentioned by the last speaker. One major challenge is the resistance to change. We do know that most people want to live in their comfort zone. They never want to experience new ways of doing things, and that's a major problem for administration. Once new changes are introduced, uh, both the individual employees as well as their unions, they are quick. They are not necessarily interested in what good is this new idea bringing? All they are interested in, we must oppose the idea. Uh, that's what we refer to as resistance to change. Some members of the administration may resist efforts to diversify. Thank you very much. Their fear is that they will lose power or privilege. It is important that the value of diversity and inclusion is not only understood, but effectively communicated in order to get the buy-in of the administrative team. Then secondly, uh, I'll just rush through that. Uh, we have implicit bias. Then the issue of uh, limited resources. Oh, yes. Then perhaps I just mentioned 
in rounding off, aside from the challenges, uh, how best we can encourage and inculcate diversity and inclusion. I just look at the headline since this paper is likely to go out. One strategy is in the recruitment and hiring processes. Implementing inclusive hiring practices, such as actively seeking diverse candidates and eliminating bias in the selection processes. Recruitment processes should be designed to cater for different members of the society and create equal opportunities for all, irrespective of gender, race, ethnicity, gender, etc., uh, in order to promote diversity and inclusion. Then we also have professional development and training. Providing training on diversity, equity, and inclusion for current administrators will help to promote awareness and understanding. Ditto for students. If this concept is one of those training efforts that are put in place, you'll find that people will better understand and value this whole idea of diversity and inclusion. Of course, we have here mentorship and support programs. We also have creating inclusive policies. There needs to be a, a policy that specifically gives strength to this whole idea of uh, uh, diversity. And finally, we need to, that's the university system, needs to engage in community outreach. The community in which the university is located, as well as other communities of interest, they play primary role in enhancing university administration. So it is good to build partnership with such uh, communities. Conclusion. Enhancing diversity and inclusion in university administration is essential for creating a welcoming and equitable campus environment. By implementing strategies such as inclusive hiring processes, professional development programs, and inclusive policies, universities can strive towards a more diverse and inclusive administrative team, ultimately benefiting the entire university community. However, addressing the challenges associated with achieving true diversity and inclusion requires ongoing commitment and collaboration from all stakeholders within and outside the education sector, government, and international partners. There can be no movement forward unless every person commits to examining bias and discrimination across our institutions, taking action, and amplifying marginalized experiences in developing more equitable initiatives. Our work is not done. We cannot change the past, but we can commit to creating a more equitable future for all. We must fix the system so that it works profitably for the individual, the larger community, and the society. If we must know, diversity and inclusion are not just good ideas, and they are not just charitable acts or feel good concepts that exist for a specified period of time. Committing to these values in both personal and professional settings definitely has a positive impact on our social well-being and on the larger community and the society. It is time to change our society for the better. Thanks for listening. And we have two goodwill messages. One is from the head of service of Edo State, who has joined us virtually. He will give his goodwill message virtually. And the other will be the representative of the Chief Justice of Edo State, the Honorable Justice Isaac Bemi. He will give the other goodwill message. Your Excellency, the Governor of Edo State, here ably represented. Uh, permit me to say all other protocols duly observed. Let me start by congratulating uh, the institution, the management of uh, the institution, for the many efforts that have been made uh, that have resulted in the growth and development of this institution for the past eight years. Uh, I align 
in saying that it is difficult to imagine that this institution is just eight years old. But here we are, and that's what it is, eight years, and there have been many, many successes recorded on different fronts. I want to thank the Vice Chancellor and all the leaders of this institution for all the efforts that have been made. But I think also that we must thank His Excellency the Governor, Mr. Godwin Oregas of Baseki, for the support that he has given to this institution, uh, which has enabled it to thrive and to do well so far. It's a Founders Day event, and so we must also appreciate the immediate past governor, His Excellency Comrade Adam Soshomole, for the efforts at setting up this university and giving it uh, the impetus to grow and develop. I want to urge you, uh, leadership and students of this institution, to not drop the ball. Uh, it's not easy to get to the point where you have gotten to now in terms of growth and development, but it's even more difficult to sustain it. So I urge you to continue to put in your best so that this institution continues to grow and develop. I cannot end this Goodwill message without expressing my thanks and appreciation to the guest speaker uh, for a very wonderful lecture and a wonderfully delivered lecture today. Uh, for me, what uh, this lecture represents is a veritable reference point for the growth and development of every university in this country and beyond this country. So I'd like us to uh, ensure that in going forward, in growing and developing this university, we always have recourse to this very beautiful lecture that was delivered today. But as head of service of Edo State, I want to crave your indulgence to just do it just a bit on the very touchy point uh, that the guest speaker made, uh, which is to the effect that it appears that universities are now gravitating towards what she called the civil service mentality. As head of service, I can't gloss over that. Uh, why um, not saying that that should be the case, because the average hour should develop differently? Hello? Hello? Okay. So why not saying that that should be the way the civil that should be the way the universities should develop and grow, but I must also mention that the so-called civil service mentality itself is even changing. Um, today, a lot really would depend on leadership. Today, in a do state, we have a civil service that is the most digitalized civil service in the whole of this country today. It is a result of the changing mentality in the civil and public service that has brought that about. Today, we have in Edo State a policy by Mr. Governor of automatic employment for first class graduates of Edo extraction from across all the universities in Nigeria. That itself may not, the, the, the result of that may not be evident immediately, but what you find in future will show very clearly why Mr. Governor has come up with this initiative. And so that itself is a product of the changing mentality as far as the civil and public service is concerned. It, it was difficult years ago to imagine that, that that has been achieved. We have moved completely from paper to a paperless government in all the ministries and departments and agencies of government. So, Things are fundamentally changing. The so-called civil service mentality is changing from a transactional uh, kind of way to a fundamentally strategic service that we now have. Merit recruitment, um, training and professional development, and I must also say that today, by virtue of what Mr. Governor has done, the public service of Edo State has the best training facilities in the whole of this country. So all of this will result in one thing, changing mentality. So I like to, I like to say that um, the mentality, the civil service mentality that we used to have, have will now change. Perhaps even the ivory towers should now begin to have recourse to us uh, in terms of their growth and development. So having said that, 
I want to thank you for all that you have done, talking about the leadership of this institution, and urge you, as I said, to not drop the ball, continue to do what you have been doing, step it up, and by the grace of God, more successes will come. On behalf of the Civil and Public Service of Edo State, I say thank you. God bless you. Thank you very thank much. You very much. Very much. Thank you very much. At this point, I would like to invite the representative of the Chief Justice of Edo State, the Honorable, Chief, the Honorable Justice Isaac Bemi, to give his goodwill message. of uh, the governor, our protocol duly observed. Uh, the judiciary is impressed about what is happening here in Yamo. I'm here representing the chief judge of the state. I'm also the judge that is here in Aochi. What I have seen here is a miracle of the century. A lot has happened. And I know that a lot more will still happen. I will uh, uh, plead with uh, the people that are within the environment to continue to encourage the university. I am sensing and seeing excellence. I'm seeing so many things that will happen in this place. I thank the management of uh, the university. People are miracle workers. You know, from a little, people have taken this school to this level. And we know that a lot will still happen and the state and the country will be blessed because of the university. Thank you very much for all you have done today. We are grateful. Thank you very much. The representative of the CJ, brief and to the point. Pro Chancellor Saab, very distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we have come to yet another high point of this event when the visitor to the university, His Excellency the Executive Governor of Edo State, Mr. Godwin Nogase Obaseki, will address this gathering. And that will be done by his representative, Professor Theophilus Agueda, who is standing for the governor today. Your Excellency, you have the microphone, sir. Chairman of this great occasion, Professor Emeritus T.O.K. Audu, members of council present, the vice chancellor, Professor Emmanuel Aluya, and members of Senate, the Royal Highnesses, members of the academia present, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure we have been told already that the visitor to this university, His Excellency, Mr. Godwin Nogegase Obaseke is unavoidably absent. Uh, Mr. His Eastern's want to make these few remarks. We're highly delighted to witness this particular event today, which is the eighth Founders Day of this great university. The, vice, uh, the visitor calls it an innovative university. I'm sure we will give a round of applause for that. We're particularly excited but that we even have this ceremony speaks volumes. As a person, I know that the academic culture in this university is almost second to none. We are also grateful to the Chancellor, Dr. Ajeremi, Makajola for his huge sacrifices to keep the university going in the right direction. Special thanks to the Chancellor, Dr. Aderimi Makajol. We appreciate your constant support. 
I express my appreciation to our speaker for allowing us to share in your word of knowledge. The keynote speaker of the day, the Vice Chancellor of Federal University, Lokoja, will celebrate your presence. To our royal fathers here present, we cannot thank you enough for always making out time to grace our university events. May Allah continue to strengthen you all. To our guests who have taken time out of their busy schedules to honor this occasion with their presence, we appreciate you. At this point, I want also to appreciate the Anthony General, who is fiscally here with us, and Mama Oshomole for her motherly presence. And finally, a special thanks goes to the Vice Chancellor, Eugenia Professor Emmanuel Aluyo, and the management team for their hard work, which has placed the university in the world map today. Vice Chancellor Sir, we say thank you. I wish everyone a safe journey home and commit you all to God's blessing. Thank you and God bless. Thank you, Mr. Registrar. With that uh, vote of thanks, we have come to the end of this event, the Founders Day activities for 2024.